Again, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to everyone gathered here. It is a good and beautiful day. I see the, I think they're minor birds. They are singing with us and they are praising with a resounding amen in their own voice. We celebrate with our moms today. We remember them, we show them our love, we shower them with our love and our appreciation. But we're also sending our love, our thoughts and prayers to other people. I'd like to show a picture to illustrate. A friend of mine shared this with me a couple of days ago, and I found it so touching. I wanted to share it with the congregation, the people at home as well. In honor of Mother's Day, we are sending love to those longing to be a mother, to those trying to conceive, to those who have experienced stillbirth, to those who have experienced a miscarriage, to those who have lost a child, be it an infant, teen, or an adult, to those who have experienced a late-term loss. I'd like to add this wording and flower as well. To those who perhaps in the past year, some of us may have lost our mothers. We remember them. We shower them with our love, our appreciation. We cover them in our prayers. Today is a good a day as any to pick up the phone, to put pen to paper and write a card, and to send that note, that phone call or text to our loved ones, and to say, I'm thinking of you. I love you, I honor you, uh, you are my brother, you are my sister, you are my friend. And so brothers and sisters, before we get into God's word this morning, would you join with me? I'd like to pray, uh, for basically an all of the above prayer uh, as we get set to get ready into the word of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for our moms. I know that for many of us, experiencing and realizing the love of God first took place through the tangible love given to us by our earthly mothers and fathers. Yet at the same time, God, we, uh, we, we celebrate, we cherish them, but we also pray for many in our midst, within our communities, uh, within our circle of friends, this faith ohana, we pray for those who may have experienced pain, grief, and sorrow, and that Mother's Day does not bring about memories of joy and satisfaction and thanksgiving. Instead, it brings about sorrow and grief. We pray, O oh God, that your hand of healing, we pray, O oh God, that your presence through your Holy Spirit, would be made known to all of us on this day. God, we thank you. We love you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been going through John's first epistle, the letter of 1 John or 1 John, however you'd like to call it. It's important to note that letters are written with a purpose. It's true today, if you write an email or an actual old-fashioned letter to someone, there's always a reason behind it. It's never, you never write someone randomly. Or maybe you do, but usually you write because there's a goal in mind. The same is true of all of the epistles that we find that have come to be known as books in the New Testament. There's a reason why John wrote 1 John. There was a specific goal he had, and we get hints of it. I, I mentioned last week, John is the love apostle, the agape love of God. It's mentioned all throughout the New Testament, that agape, Greek word agape love. However, 
we see two dramatic spikes in its usage if you, if you compare all the books of the New Testament. And that is the Gospel of John and 1 John. In fact, in this epistle of 1 John, John writes about agape love 46 times. So he's getting a point across. He's, th- he's saying to the audience, the recipients of this letter, this is in the final. Take notes. <laughs> I'm giving you a hint. This is going to be on your final. You better know this. The agape love of God. Now, why was John so insistent that the people would know God's agape love? There was a deeper reason. And the reason is John saw and recognized there were other forces at work trying to infiltrate and influence the early church communities. And some of these influencers were not healthy. They were not true. They were not spirit-inspired teachings. There is one school of thought that sought to penetrate the early church. It became known as what we call today as Gnosticism. Gnosticism from the Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, which means knowing or knowledge. And Gnosticism sought to sneak its way into the early church in the form of, look, there is a secret hidden knowledge about the things of God and about Jesus that these apostles are not teaching you. So here I am. Uh, for four easy payments of forty nine ninety five, it too can be, I'm just kidding. They did not. <laughs> but it almost comes across as a slick salesman, yeah? When they say, hey, I have something that uh, Peter, James, and John don't know about Jesus. So here you go. You want to know it? And with that kind of subterfuge, they sought to infiltrate the early church. Now, John saw this, being full of the Spirit, full of wisdom and grace, wrote to the community, not so fast. Don't fall for that. That's counterfeit. You don't want to learn that. Now, the specific school of Gnosticism that was trying to infiltrate this early church community was what we come to know as docetism. You don't have to know that. That's not going to be on the final. But docetism is a particular theology that Jesus, and the simplest way to put it is this. Jesus was not actually physical, material. It was heavily influenced by Greek thinking, a dualistic world, the spirit realm being good, the physical realm being bad. And if that's the case, then of course all that is good from God must only be spirit. It cannot be of the physical. And so that, okay, so why is that important, Pastor Sam? Why is that critical for our understanding? Why was that critical for the audience of Epistle of John, first letter of John? It was important because the implications of Jesus not appearing in the flesh is such that, well, if Jesus didn't appear in the flesh, that means that Jesus did not fully incarnate. Incarnational reality, that God came and, be- and the word of God became flesh. Furthermore, that also means that Jesus does not fully identify with the human experience. Our, our hunger, our pain, our sufferings, our shame, Jesus knows nothing about. So we have a Savior who saved us uh, with a six-foot pole, like d- did not really touch the, the lived experience of hum- humankind. Furthermore, if that means that Jesus wasn't physical, that means that the cross behind me on the column, the cross is uh, it's a, a spiritual thing. It didn't really happen. Jesus didn't actually suffer and die. And so when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, on the first Sunday of every month, we gather, we remember the body of Christ broken for us. We remember the blood of Christ poured out for us for the forgiveness of sins for you and for many. When we remember that, when we practice that, the docetic school of thought is saying, useless, optional. No, you don't really need that. And so here is where one John comes in, and John kind of nips it in the bud. I want to read verse 6 for you as, a, as kind of a recap, and with all of that context in mind, 
I think verse 6 will pop. Verse 6, John writes, Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by His baptism in water and by shedding His blood on the cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit, who is truth, confirms it with the, His testimony. We see here John is saying, look, love came down, love of God, the agape love of God came to us in the form of Jesus, who is now the risen Christ. We know love because we know Jesus. We've come to experience God's love because we have encountered the risen Christ. This is good news. This is truly amazing. This is something we invite all of you to come to embrace and experience once again. John is writing to the community there. You gotta know this. God's love is real. God's love is tangible. And all throughout the epistle of 1 John, John is making reference to that reality. For example, the previous chapter, chapter four, John goes on to say, listen, sisters and brothers, you got to love one another. How can a man say, I love God, but hate his brother? And John is writing, of course, of course, to the community. How can he say you worship God and you love God when the worship leader sings your favorite hymn, your hands are raised, your eyes are closed, and you're swaying with the Spirit, but as soon as the doxology and the benediction are done and over with, and you go outside of the gathering place, you look at your brother or sister in Christ who came to worship that day, and you give them stink eye. Or in your heart, in your mind, you harbor judgmental thoughts. Oh, what's he doing at church? I know what he did last night. He was partying all night, and now he's here worshiping, right? And John is saying, listen, nip it in the bud. You have those kind of thoughts? There is an inconsistency in your faith formation. You cannot worship God with open arms, closed eyes, and then look upon your sister or brother in fellowship and harbor anger, angst, judgmentalism, it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. And John is saying, instead, love actively. Love tangibly. Love practically. You say you love God? Demonstrate your love by your love for each other. You say you love God? Demonstrate your love by loving the world around you, caring for them. You say you love God, show it with your actions. There is an action to love that we come to see in John's narrative here. In this passage today, in chapter 5, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ becomes a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves God's children too. John writes, we know we love God's children if we love God and obey God's commandments. Loving God means to keep God's commandments. And what are God's greatest commandments? As Jesus himself teaches us, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. To love your neighbor as yourself. That is key. On this Mother's Day, Many of us remember the care and the love that we received from our mothers. I prayed about this, that for many of us, we came to our first knowledge of God's love through the love, the tangible, experienced love from mom. From back when we were young. I remember my own mom, a pastor's wife, caring for the household, assisting my father in ministry duties at the church, but also loving me, her son, and demonstrating her love through countless hours of prayers, of caring for me, of providing for my every need. And Mother's Day gives you an opportunity to kind of look back and, sh and, sh and realize with appreciation, wow, um, our parents really did bend over backwards to make sure that we were provided for and that we were cared for. I might get into a lot of trouble saying this, but even my own wife, her, uh, Minnie, her earliest memories of her mom, her earliest, her first memories as a youngster, as a toddler, is 4.30 in the morning, her mom gently waking her up, 
putting her on her back and walking that country road to the church for 5 a.m. early morning prayer. That's a thing uh, in, the, in the Korean culture, in the Korean church culture, to pray every morning at 5 a.m. together as a church community. And not wanting to leave Minnie home alone, uh, little baby Minnie would be strapped along behind mom's back, laid on the pew, and falling in and out of consciousness while she's sleeping, because it's still daybreak, hearing mom's fervent prayers being lifted up to the heavens. And that's her earliest memories. And it was such that it would leave a deep impression upon my wife where, uh, you know, she doesn't strap the three kids on her back and bring them to church. But I'll tell you what, the, the daily and nightly prayers, like, to me it's the same thing that Elizabeth, Johan, and Eliana are recipients of. Uh, they're receiving the same tangible love that my wife herself received as a young child. And we see this, uh, the passing down of the faith of love. I think for many of us, we realize on Mother's Day the tremendous impact of a mom's love that was placed upon our lives. For us, as we close, my encouragement to us is uh, we think about John's exhortation, love one another, love God, love tangibly. Don't love in this theoretical realm. Love the way Jesus loved. Jesus came alongside us. Jesus suffered for us. Jesus took up our pain. Jesus healed us. Jesus fed us. That same tangible love of Jesus, the good shepherd. Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let us love each other with. And so we go forth from this place, and that is our homework. Our homework is, God, how can I live out this love uh, that you have given to me, and that you are calling me, to give out to the world. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your love, most clearly expressed to us through the example set forth by Jesus, the risen Christ. And thank you, God, that you have made it clear we are invited to come alongside you, O Holy Spirit, to demonstrate such love to a world that is so desperate for God's loving touch. May we, the church, the people of Aea UMC, may we be vessels through which your love flows freely among us, each one another, but ultimately to the ends of the earth. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.